Well, I think it's um, it's a proper time to um, uh, start. Uh, even though I see the attendee list still um, uh, growing, uh, but let's um, let's start um, uh, rolling. Um, good morning um, from Tallinn, uh, live from Tallinn and Frankfurt. This is the the first ever report launch of ICDS done in a webinar format. Uh, this is a report we did together in cooperation with. SIPA, uh, Center for European Policy Analysis uh, from uh, Washington, Washington, but we have Jen Ben Hoches joining us from Frankfurt. Good to see you all, dear friends, uh, and our regulars and uh, new participants at our report launch. Um, very sorry that we cannot have you all physically at our big seminar room in Narva. Much, but I'm sure that time will come uh, for other reports uh, for that to uh, materialize. Um, uh, for all, all of those participants, attendees who uh, who you have um, dressed up in order to look good on video, it's, uh, sorry we don't see you. Uh, so you could have joined us also in the bathroom. Uh, but without further ado, I will now hand the screen over to. Martin Hurt, who is a uh, defense researcher, researcher at ICDS, and he will be presenting the house rules and the panelists. Martin, please, the screen is yours. Thank you, Sven. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I would like to echo Sven and, and say welcome to everybody and uh, happy to see the, the list of names uh, increasing and uh, this uh, event uh, is uh, uses the Zoom platform, uh, but people are also able to follow a live stream of the event via YouTube, which is why this is a public event. Uh, I will uh, first make a couple of administrative remarks, and then I will introduce our two speakers, after which I will ask them a couple of uh, questions to set the scene, and uh, then I will open up the floor for questions from the audience. Uh, if a member of the audience participating via Zoom wishes to ask a question, there is a uh, question and answer button in the bottom of the screen. And by pressing this button, a window will open where you can write and submit questions. And uh, uh, feel free to address them to one or both of the speakers. And uh, you may start submitting your questions already now. Uh, and next, allow me to introduce our two speakers. First, uh, Lieutenant General Ben Hodges uh, holds the Pershing Chair in Strategic Studies at the Center for European Policy Analysis. He graduated from the United States Military Academy in 1980 and was commissioned in the infantry. He has commanded uh, infantry units at the company, battalion and brigade levels in the 101st Airborne Division and in Operation Iraqi Free. He also served as Director of Operations, uh, RC South in Kandahar, Afghanistan. General Hodges has served in a variety of positions, including as Commander NATO Allied Land Command. And his last military assignment was as Commander United States Army Europe from 2014 to 2017. Uh, he is currently based in Germany. Our second speaker today, Tony Lawrence, is the head of the Defense Policy and Strategy Program at, here at the International Center for Defense and Security in Estonia. Before joining the ICDS, Tony spent the first half of his career as a civil servant in the UK Ministry of Defense, including appointments in scientific research and procurement, policy positions dealing with NATO issues, uh, the European Union security and defense dimension, and last but not least, ballistic missile defense. And uh, to be fair and precise, uh, this report was written by three authors, and the third gentleman is Mr. Ray Wojcik, the director of the Center for European Policy Analysis in Warsaw. 
He has had a long and successful career in the U.S. Army. Uh, Ray does not participate in today's seminar. And with this, uh, I will turn to General Hodges to set the scene and to provide the uh, context. And I will ask my questions one by one. And I will start with the, the first very general question. Uh, why is military mobility so important? Hey, Martin. Uh, good morning, and, and thanks for this opportunity. The military mobility uh, is essential to effective deterrence. Uh, we have to demonstrate that we can move as fast or faster than Russian Federation forces so that they don't make the terrible miscalculation that they might be able to achieve some uh, effects before the alliance or um, friends of uh, allies can get there in time. So being able to demonstrate that we can move that quickly is an important part of signaling to the Kremlin, that do not make a mistake. The, um, it's, it's also about giving our political leaders some options other than a liberation campaign. Uh, if we can't move as fast or faster than Russian forces, then uh, that's, how, that's what we end up having to do is a liberation campaign up into Lithuania or Latvia or Estonia or perhaps Romania. That's why this is so important. Thank you. Uh, how does the military mobility challenge uh, today compare with the Cold War? Uh, why do we seem to need to relearn so much after so many years of expeditionary operations outside Europe? Because one would think, right or wrong, that if we are able to deploy our forces to Afghanistan and elsewhere, then we would be able to move our forces also within Europe. Uh, it's a great question, uh, and I was a little surprised myself back in uh, 2014 when I uh, showed up as the commander of U.S. Army Europe. I just assumed that we would be able to go everywhere uh, because these were all NATO countries. They were all members of the European Union, uh, Schengen. Uh, I, just, I, I was naive, but I assumed that we would be able to move uh, almost anywhere. Plus, um, I think we were spoiled a little bit by the, the freedom of movement we had, you know, from Kuwait up through Iraq or being able to kind of move around Afghanistan, at least in terms of no restrictions on weight or sovereignty, that sort of thing. So, uh, and, and then of course I was a Lieutenant in Germany a very long time ago when it was West Germany and East Germany. And uh, the front line was the inner German border. And so almost all the Americans, the British, the Bundeswehr units that were the Dutch units that were uh, in West Germany were probably only three hours away from their general defense positions uh, that we practice going to all the time. And the infrastructure, the bridges, you know, all over West Germany, even today, you see that ubiquitous uh, yellow circular sign that has the profile of a tank or a truck and it tells you the weight of the bridge. It was so common. Uh, but everything changed at the end of the Cold War. Um, and frankly, we never thought about having to move across uh, Eastern Germany and Poland uh, up into Lithuania or Estonia or down to Romania. Uh, never thought about it until Russia's uh, invasion of Ukraine and uh, illegal annexation of the Crimean Peninsula. The distance to go from say Baumholder Germany or Vilsack Germany, where we have a lot of US troops that are based, uh, for example, from there to Tallinn is the same distance as going from St. Louis, Missouri up to Bangor, Maine. So the, the distances are completely different and you're crossing international boundaries, uh, borders of sovereign nations that are also allies. And then of course there's an infrastructure challenge. The, the weight of a Abrams tank or a German Leopard, the latest Leopard um, or British Challenger, fully loaded is somewhere between 70 and 80 tons. Uh, not too many bridges uh, as you get east of Berlin are built to sustain that kind of weight. So th those are the challenges that we uh, encountered. And, and uh, in hindsight, I personally, I, I was naive. Thank you. Uh, Defender Europe 20 was to exercise military mobility on a scale that we have not seen since the Cold War. Uh, what 
is uh, likely to be the impact of the downscaling of this exercise due to COVID-19? Well, of course, Defender 20, um, uh, so much work went into it for the year leading up to the actual execution. And, and so there's a natural disappointment that uh, all this work and anticipation was didn't come to complete fruition. But um, I'd say three things about Defender 20. Uh, first of all, um, it's, it sent a very strong signal to all of our allies that uh, the United States still committed the amount of money that went into this, the amount of work that went into this, the amount of resources that went into this exercise. Uh, when it's not a, uh, it's not a vote getter. I mean, in an election year for the administration, this is not the kind of thing that would inspire millions of voters to, to vote for the administration. Uh, yet the administration was committed to this exercise. So that's, that's a strong signal of commitment to our allies. Number two, it's a signal to the Kremlin that the United States is still willing to commit resources, uh, effort, money uh, to demonstrate uh, capability. And so that, that's an important, important part of deterrence. And then the third thing to keep in mind is that um, a lot of the hard work was in fact done. All the coordination, all the, 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 the ports, airports, the seaports, the routes, the coordination uh, with the uh, allied nations for host nation support, very complicated. And so infrastructure uh, and network of people, most of which are going to be civilian that run all the transportation networks, for example, or contractors that provide host nation support. Um, this is not something you just show up and expect to have happen. So uh, I think uh, I won't speak for General Cavoli, but I'm confident that uh, he and his staff were very pleased with the amount of progress and work that was done in that regard. And we still got about a third, I think, of the troops and equipment uh, came over. Uh, one of the things that they had to practice, of course, was the, uh, the drawing of equipment, the pre-positioned equipment. Um, we have some of this in uh, the Netherlands, in Belgium, in Germany, and eventually one brigade will be in Poland, in Powitz. Uh This also helps speed things up. But I, but I do want to uh, also comment that Military mobility is not just about uh, large, long planned movements. If we're thinking, if we're talking about speed um, and, and being able to deter the Kremlin from making a terrible miscalculation, um, you have to assume that the, the Kremlin, of course, knows how our decision making process works, that for NATO to respond, it's going to take uh, consensus. Now, that doesn't mean that you won't have the U.S. and other countries responding unilaterally or multilaterally. But nonetheless, um, speed of recognition is what starts this whole thing. And when you think of how the Russians will be ambiguous in what they're doing to delay our ability to recognize what's happening and then to make the political decision to do things um, that will possibly be seen as escalatory or provocative, such as pulling a patriot uh, missiles out of storage in MISAL, or when you start uh, moving equipment and troops around quickly, that could be seen as provocative or escalatory. So uh, speed of recognition, speed of decision, and then finally speed of assembly. How fast can you assemble uh, a battle group or brigade combat team or move aircraft and, and ammunition around? Uh, th that's why the speed is so important. And this is going to happen within days not after a year of planning, but within days uh, and probably in peacetime conditions, meaning that um, we won't have priority on rail. Um, all the European Union or, and national regulations will still remain in effect. Again, because our political leaders understandably are not, one are going, are not wanting to do something that looks provocative or escalatory. So that's the key. Military mobility has to work in peacetime conditions, very short notice. The big exercises help us figure out the infrastructure and who's who, but what I'm really after and what this project that Tony led us uh, in his excellent study um, is about movement, not, not planned movement, but in a crisis or near crisis conditions, peacetime regulations in effect, can we still move as fast or faster than Russian Federation forces?
Um, thank you. Uh, uh, solving these issues related to military mobility will be both expensive and also time consuming. Uh, what should we prioritize and, and where can we find the resources? Well, the, the European Union um, carries the bulk of the responsibility for solution because the challenges are in the, uh, the ability to cross borders with war materials. Uh, the uh, second set of challenges, and there are literally hundreds of laws that have to be changed when you take into account each nation um, and at the uh, level, like here in Germany, you know, the, the Bundesland or the states have a lot of authority. So you, the federal government in Berlin can't just declare something. The, the states also have a role. And you have similar uh, federated regulations inside Poland and uh, other countries as well. So for me, that's the number one priority is, is getting the permissions done, preset, reducing the amount of time that's required. Uh, secondly, it's the uh, capacity. Uh, rail, uh, transportation, cyber protection of airports and seaports. These are things that are national responsibilities. NATO does not have money to disperse and make all the problem, transportation problems go away. NATO's job is to convey to the nations, here's our priorities, here's, here's what we need. And then the nations and the European Union have to agree to do it. So the, the money, comes from there and the effort to get the regulations changed. Those, those to me are the, are the two priorities. Now the Alliance could help by, I think, taking a more sophisticated approach to what 2% actually means. That money that's spent on dual use transportation infrastructure, uh, improving the ability for Alliance forces to move, that will also have uh, commercial value, uh, cyber protection of Port of Bremerhaven, for example. To me, that is so important that it should also, whatever Germany spends on that should count towards their 2%. Uh, thank you. Uh, you uh, wrote the report in the early part of this year before the COVID-19 pandemic hit, uh, hit us. Uh, if you were writing the report today, what would you change or add to reflect COVID-19? Um, well, to be fair, uh, I want to make sure that Tony uh, Lawrence gets uh, credit. He and, and Ray did the, the vast majority of the of the hard work here. I'm very proud to be associated with it. But to answer your question, um, the pandemic obviously has demonstrated number one um, the vulnerability of movement because we depend so much on host nation support. The rail highways, power generation, all of these things depend on civilian contractors and host nation governments to enable the movement. This is not just the US Army or the Bundeswehr just moving across uh, Europe at will. It depends so much on host nation support. So uh, when a nation has to uh, worry about uh, the spread of a virus or some other type of uh, non-military specific threat, it affects our ability to move. So I think I would, in hindsight, I would probably, or the next time we do this, um, would take that into account. Uh, the second thing, of course, the, uh, the impact on, all, on the economies of all of our nations is uh, staggering. Certainly the United States, the number, millions of unemployed, the hits on GDP, uh, it, it's affecting all of us. And so uh, when I watched the, uh, the border between Poland and Germany get shut or shut down on, with no notice, and I think all, everybody saw the video of the Stau, the, the traffic backed up 60 kilometers of people trying to move from Germany into or through Poland, um, that, was, that was a shock. And, and I think you know, what, was, what was caught up in that shutdown of borders was not only normal traffic, but also medical supplies, medical equipment. Uh, we discover a lot of healthcare workers, for example, might live in one country, but work in another country. So in an attempt to contain the virus, we inadvertently um, disrupted the flow of things necessary to fight the virus. Or uh, particularly uh, countries like Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, uh, 
people were trying to get home in compliance with government orders and you had to drive through Poland to get home, of course, and they couldn't. And so you end up nations getting ferries to bring people from uh, Germany back home, back home to uh, Estonia or Latvia or Lithuania. Uh, and what, as I thought about it, many of the same mechanisms that are required to improve cross-border mobility to allow it are the same ones that are necessary for military mobility. So I think there's a lot of uh, overlap between military mobility and crisis mobility. So I, I think if I was to do it all over again, that those are things that I would uh, take into account. Good, thank you. Uh, and my last question to you uh, currently is, uh, if you uh, would uh, make an assessment of what, what could we expect from the future in terms of deployment exercises to and within Europe? Well, um, the United States is already working on Defender 21, of course, um, and, and it'll be not quite the scale of Defender 20, uh, but still a significant exercise that currently um, is aiming to use five different ports uh, along uh, the Adriatic and the Aegean. Um, it'll be oriented towards the uh, Balkans and the Black Sea region um, next year. So uh, this, this is this is important part of uh, deterrence and it's, it's an important part of readiness. So uh, I, I would expect to see uh, everything that's already planned for 21 that that will continue. Um, you know, the threats, the threats that we faced that everybody knew about six months ago are still there and they're gonna be here six months from now. So our political leaders have got to be candid and honest with their voters, with their citizens about the threats. I mean, uh, the Russians and Chinese have not backed off one bit, um, even as they deal with the virus themselves in terms of aggressive behavior, illegal behavior. Uh, Ukrainian soldiers are still dying in the Donbass uh, every week. Um, Russia's aggression in uh, Georgia, the 20% of Georgia that they still occupy, all of this is still going on. And, and so um, the exercises will continue. I think Estonia decision to continue with the spring storm exercise, uh, very uh, important and uh, this is what deterrence is about. And the failed deterrence is much more expensive uh, than deterrence. I fully agree. Uh, thank you, General Hodges. Uh, I would now turn uh, to Tony and uh, ask a number of questions. Uh, and I would uh, design those questions according to the uh, three main areas uh, that we have seen in the report legal and procedural area, uh, infrastructure and command and control. Uh, and I'll package the uh, question, uh, the first two uh, into one. So I know, Tony, that you being a Brit have an extensive experience with working with the EU. Uh, and what is the role of the EU? And have we seen any concrete results of, of EU taking a greater role in enhancing military mobility in both the legal and procedural context and also in uh, in terms of infrastructure. Thank you, Martin, and, and good morning to everybody. Um, just before I start, I'd like to uh, also acknowledge Ray Volchik, who unfortunately can't be with us today, but um, as the third author of the report made a, made a key uh, key uh, impact on, on the study and, and the report. I'd also like to say hello to, to Sean Fay. Um, I don't see him on the list of participants, but perhaps he's watching via, via the stream. Uh, Sean is our, our intern and has been with ICDS for several months. Uh, unfortunately, for the last few weeks, he's been back in the, back in the States. He was repatriated to, to Georgia, uh, Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, uh, he's hopefully watching us from there. But he also had a large part in, uh, to play in, in the, the basic research to, to underpin this report. So good morning to you, Sean. So, um, yes, I think it's, um, it's quite nice to be able to start by talking about the legal and procedural problems because uh, of the three sets of challenges that we talk about in the report. And uh, incidentally, while I, while I think about it, here is the report. Um, I haven't been in the office here for, for several several weeks, so I haven't actually seen a, a physical copy of it today, but it, it does exist in hard copy form as well. Um, but of the three sets of challenges that we, we talk about, um, the legal and procedural is, is probably the one that's of least concern to, to the movers out there. 
Um, the basic problem, as, as Ben has briefly mentioned, is that when you move military units across Europe, uh, there are bits of paperwork that need to be completed, things like cross-border movement positions, customs declarations, and, and so forth. And these can take time, and sometimes weeks of time, and of course that has the potential to delay military movement. Um, the good news in this area is that there's a lot of work already underway in NATO, and to come to your question, Martin, particularly in the EU. And the EU takes the lead on many issues to do with European customs arrangements and so on and so forth, and it's quite natural that, that it should uh, should lead on this uh, these dealing with these questions. Uh, rather than, than perhaps perhaps NATO. Uh, so there's a lot of work going on to standardize procedures and to reduce times for the completion of procedures and so on and so forth. Most of the people we spoke to in, in conducting the study felt that dealing with these challenges is going to be a fairly straightforward task and that um, further progress is going to be made fairly readily in this area. Having said that, um, it's probably worth noting that there is still a very complex network, complex maze of, of numerous procedures uh, and uh, that are, are armed forces have to go through in trying to move forces across Europe, many jurisdictions to cross. And it's still the case that the armed forces today arrive at borders with the wrong paperwork and, and that takes time to sort out. So it's important that this issue, uh, although it's the, the easier of the three, uh, continues to be given political attention and we continue to take steps to make things easier. I'd like to also make the point that in our study, um, we mostly talked about and thought about the restoration of territory scenario, the deliberation campaign that Ben mentioned earlier. This is the sort of the classic Baltic fait accompli scenario in which an aggressor has seized territory in the Baltic region and NATO needs to move forces up here to drive the aggressor back out again. Um, so we were thinking and talking about the movement of large and heavy forces because these are things that are really going to stress the movement system overall the most. And in that kind of scenario, uh, the deployment time uh, is going to be long and the time for sorting out the paperwork is not going to be a critical path item. But there is uh, a second scenario in which NATO moves forces into the region to deter a military action. So this is perhaps something like deploying the VJTF or deploying one of the American uh, rapid reaction units that are stationed in, in Europe. And in that scenario, the premium is going to be very much on speed. And the time that's taken, the time that's needed to deal with the bureaucracy is going to be the same order of magnitude as the time for the movement itself. And uh, that's a scenario in which legal and procedural obstacles might have an operational impact. Uh, and of course, we're talking here about air movement as well. And, and most of the work that the EU and NATO have focused on has been land and, and sea movement. So um, one of the recommendations of the report is that that scenario is something that also needs to be exercised. Uh, the VJTF is never deployed to the Baltic region. It's certainly not done so on a, on a no notice or short notice basis. Thank you, Tony. Uh... I would also like to, to ask about the third uh, um, area, main area of the report, uh, command and control. Could you please briefly explain the challenges related to, to command and control? Sure. Um, so of the three sets of challenges, this is, this is the one of the, 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 the larger ones, um, the two larger ones, and, and it's probably the one that needs the most intellectual thought and, and is most intellectually demanding to sort out. Um, the issue here is that there is a, a plethora of organizations that are involved in the business of military movement across Europe. And if I just give you a, a list of some of the key ones, just sort of to, to set out the, the scope of, of the problem. So at the strategic level, SHAPE has something called the Allied Movement Coordination Center. Uh, as you move down to the op operational and tactical levels, then each of the joint force commands, so that's Norfolk, Naples, and Brunson, each has a joint logistics support group. And NATO supplements those with its own standing joint logistics support group. Uh, there's a new uh, joint support and enabling command of the JSEC, uh, which has the responsibility for looking after Sakura's rear area, and it too has a, a joint logistics support group. There are eight NATO force integration units, so one each in uh, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Poland in, in terms of our region. Uh, there are as many national movement coordination centers as there are countries that you're moving through, and there are as many national logistics organizations as there are countries that are trying to move. So just by sort of setting out that list, I think you can see it's, it's fairly evident that there's a potential here for overlap and for confusion. And in the course of the study, we, we asked people how these organizations would fit together, how they relate to each other, how they would work together in a crisis. And we met a lot of shrug shoulders. Um, the business of moving armies is, of course, very complex. It involves a lot of problem solving, a lot of ad hocery, a lot of creativity. But at the same time, it was quite a surprise to us, I think, to find that even the people who are responsible for moving don't really have a clear picture of how these organizations will all fit together to, to enable a movement to, to take place efficiently and effectively. Um, in this area, I think it's worth highlighting the, the role of the Joint Support Enabling Command, the JSEC. 
This is a new uh, four structure command. Uh, it's built around Germany as a framework nation and uh, its establishment as a kind of coordinating agency. Uh, I think you can see is NATO's recognition that there is a problem in this area that needs to be solved. Um, JSEC achieved initial operating capability last September and it's developed for itself a, a very impressive uh, and ambitious operating concept. And it does have an important role to play. But um, at least at the time of our study, we found that uh, very few people really had an understanding of what the JSEC role is or what the JSEC thinks its role is. And many of them had an expectation that the JSEC is going to take on a role and take on tasks that it perhaps doesn't have the mandate or the resources for. Um, so I said at the beginning that this is a kind of an intellectual problem to sort out. And, and, and one of the ways in which we, we think we can, uh, we can uh, help this is by doing tabletop exercises, scenario-based discussions, to get all these organizations together and to talk about how they would uh, operate in a crisis and to try and define better their roles and their interactions so that everybody understands these kind of concepts for, for and their responsibilities for, for movement. So that's the, the C2 piece. Thank you, Tony. I guess the one of the uh, mitigating measures would be to exercise and exercise frequently, regularly, like we have seen the United States do in Europe uh, recently. Also, the UK has, uh, has started to do that. Uh, and then there is a lot of room for improvement for, for other European nations. I would like to uh, uh, open the floor for questions from the audience. Uh, we have one question uh, from James Scher. Uh, it concerns the Cold War. Uh, James has written that uh, uh, during the Cold War, we not only had a system of deterrence, but also a culture of deterrence. Uh, uh, we had over 160 violations of the IGB. Uh, and on each occasion, NATO knew it had to react to maintain deterrence. Now the system is coming back, but the culture has gone, according to James. Instead, political elites are sensitized to avoid being provocative, and that reflex can weaken deterrence. So how serious problem is that? And I would actually ask both Tony and General Hodges to, to uh, answer that. Perhaps first General Hodges. Uh, well, James, of course, has uh, identified the, the critical piece of the whole thing. Um, if, if our civilian leadership and if our citizens don't see a threat, then they are not going to demand uh, modernized ready forces. And those forces are not gonna have this culture of readiness of ready to fight tonight, whether you're a land force or on board a ship or part of uh, air policing missions, whatever your particular task or uh, territorial or border forces. Uh, so, um, our civilian leadership has got to be very clear about what the threats are. That's, that's obviously not a problem uh, in Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, or, or Romania, but it's less clear the further west you go, uh, to include even in the United States. So um, this, this culture of readiness is um, what drives people to work through all the problems and challenges that Tony um, has laid out so, so clearly. Uh, not only readiness in terms of does your equipment work or are units trained to perform their tasks um, you know, land, sea, and air, um, but it's also the, the methodology. Uh, we worked very hard in U.S. Army Europe to instill in everybody's mind a uh, fight tonight mentality, which was the norm back uh, in, in the Cold War when, when you could be called out and frequently were called out on uh, alerts to move up to your border position. It's a different time now, but you still have to have that culture of fight tonight, particularly if you're in an air defense unit, for example, um, or uh, artillery or intelligence units. You, you have to believe it, um, that that is a possibility. And by the way, just as, as a footnote, I would uh, really uh, press the alliance to improve its intelligence sharing. The best presentation uh, I ever heard on what Russia is doing came from an Estonian intelligence officer. And that was when the light came on that it's not gonna be an American satellite that detects Russian activity or movement. It's gonna be somebody in a frontline state that knows the language, the culture, probably even the people and can identify something that's happening. Now, um, 
part of this culture of readiness means that we have to be willing to train to failure, uh, meaning push exercises, uh, unplanned events, and, and be willing to accept the fact that a headquarters will eventually uh, fail until, and then it has to retrain and get better and better. Uh, a critical thing to change the U.S. Army was when we had the national created the National Training Center, and units failed routinely until until they eventually learned and got better. And right now, I have to be candid, and I'm by the way, I'm partly responsible for this, uh, or I'm guilty of this myself. So many of our exercises at the top level, where the two star and three star headquarters and the four star headquarters are in the exercise, have never failed. I mean, it, just, it doesn't happen uh, or else the exercise is so controlled. And these are smart people. So it would be part of changing the culture of readiness should also include people at the very top level telling their commanders, if you didn't fail in an exercise, that means the exercise was too easy. I mean, we know from the history of warfare, there are so many challenges and problems and you have a thinking enemy that's going to do everything they can to wreck your communications disrupt your logistics, destroy your infrastructure. So um, I, part of the reason we still don't know who the NFIUs report to or who the JSEC actually, what they do, is because we have never exercised it to the hilt in a full comprehensive way. And, and I think uh, that, that would really be a great stroke um, if, if to help change the culture of readiness if uh, we, and forget the DV days. I mean, I'm, I'm guilty of hosting DV days, um, but that takes so much energy um, away from the actual exercise and nobody's gonna have a DV day and allow a unit to fail in front of all the visitors. So that's, I think this is an important part of it. Uh, thank you, Tony. Thank you, Martin and James. Thank you for the question. Good morning to you. Um, I don't want to add anything to the um, the culture of deterrence point, but I would also like to mention uh, another culture, and that's the culture of resilience, which is important in this context. Um, when we talk about moving forces across Europe, basically we're talking about using civilian owned assets. The roads, the railways are all civilian owned. The heavy equipment transporters that the armored vehicles will sit on are all civilian owned. Uh, the ports are civilian owned. And uh, for commercial reasons, those operations are conducted on a just-in-time basis and there's no redundancy in operations. Um, if, uh, if we have damage to the roads and railways, it's going to be repaired by civilian companies. Again, they don't have the spare capacity to do this, uh, this kind of operation 24, on a 24-7 basis. Um, and I think we've kind of, again, from the Cold War, lost this idea of this, this culture of resilience that, uh, that we, we saw in, in Europe. And that's something else that, uh, that will perhaps need to change new new mindsets as, uh, as we move forward. Good, thank you, Tony. Uh, we have another question from uh, the Ambassador of Georgia to Estonia. Uh, it is about uh, security in, in the Black Sea region and uh, NATO exercises in that region. Uh, NATO's exercises with special focus on the movement related to capabilities in the Black Sea region and how important is the involvement of uh, NATO partner countries in such exercises uh, and uh, that question would go to General Hodges. Well uh, Ambassador good morning and, th and thank you for this question. One of the best exercises that uh, our most enjoyable exercises I remember is when we took a striker squadron that drove, literally drove on the road in their strikers all the way from their home base in Vilsack, Germany, participated in exercises in Hungary and Romania, and then ended up at a seaport in Bulgaria, loaded onto ships or ferries in Bulgaria, sailed across the Black Sea and uh, disembarked in Poti in Georgia, and then road marched across all the way across Georgia to a training area outside of Tbilisi. That was about three months of constant exercising by the squadron and they did live fire exercises all along the way as well. So um, that we, we uh, cross rivers, cross the Black Sea, road march, rail, the full range of things that you might expect land forces to do. And obviously we learned a, a ton and uh, quite a test for the maintenance 
capabilities of that striker uh, squadron as well. The, the ability to keep their vehicles running for such uh, heavy use, which by the way, is what you would expect in a conflict that they might be in, in combat for sustained combat for months like that. So we learned a lot from that and being able to go to Georgia uh, gave us opportunities. And by the way, uh, the Kremlin needs to know that the United States and other countries, the, the UK, for example, are willing to go all the way to Georgia uh, to protect a friend, even if they're not yet inside the alliance. Uh, we, we did an exercise in Sweden called Aurora, where we had Patriot uh, battery deploy ground and uh, convoy up and then cross ferry over into Sweden, from Denmark into Sweden and then eventually got out to Gotland Island. Uh, that was a challenge. Uh, but again, it was part of the deterrence of demonstrating that we're willing to go to places that the, that the Kremlin might think are up for grabs because they're not in NATO. Um, this, this was an important part of the, uh, of the training. And frankly, um, I think when it comes down to the end of the day, uh, countries like Sweden, Finland, Georgia, Ukraine uh, will become, uh, will be part of the competition. Uh, if there's a conflict, it's, it's gonna be there. So we have, we have to practice doing that. And if you think about trying to get to Romania, uh, the, armor, the US Armor Brigade combat team that's based primarily in Poland, it has one battalion that's always at MK in Romania. To get from Poland to central Romania is a challenge because of the Carpathian Mountains. And, and so you have to figure, We've either got to improve transit over the Carpathians or you're going to have to go around them through Ukraine. Uh, and, and so partner countries are, are an important part of this overall um, deterrence effort. And I would add one last thing, um, Belarus, uh, the E-40 project that's uh, being considered that stitches together the Baltic Sea to the Black Sea uh, by rivers and canals. Poland, Belarus into Ukraine uh, is, a, is another area, uh, infrastructure, artery that uh, ought to be developed that obviously has economic benefit as well. Uh, thank you, General, and uh, thank you for broadening the, the answer from, from the Black Sea region to, to also the, uh, the Baltic Sea region and, uh, and elsewhere. Uh, we have a a new question also, it's, uh, it was partially answered, I think, by Tony, but it's about the civilian transport sector that is being hard hit by the COVID pandemic. And the question is, how big is the risk to military mobility? Uh, I would be happy to give this to, to any of you, perhaps General Hodges. Well, uh, of course, we, we depend on the civilian transportation sector, all the rail. Uh, right now, there is only enough capacity of Deutsche Bahn cargo to move 1.5 armor brigades simultaneously, one and a half brigades. That's not one and a half German, that's one and a half of anybody. So clearly that is inadequate capacity. So how can uh, we incentivize uh, Germany, for example, to put more money into rail capacity to, for moving uh, heavy armored equipment? Uh, the heavy equipment transports, the trucks that are used to move tanks and uh, large uh, armored vehicles on highways, uh, there's not many of those. This would be a great place for countries like Belgium or Luxembourg to, uh, to build up uh, heavy equipment transport that also can be used for civilian, civilian use for moving uh, construction equipment. You've all seen bulldozers, for example, uh, on the back of these uh, heavy equipment transports. I think. Um, uh, for sustained operations, river traffic is really going to be important. I, I think the Danube River is way underdeveloped uh, for what it could be. And this, is, then this comes back to the economic uh, aspect. If Georgia would get going with this uh, project to build the port of Anaclia, then Georgia becomes the hub, the logistics hub between uh, Eurasia and Europe. It would, it would facilitate rapid uh, movement of, of commerce from east to west and from west to east, moving across the Black Sea. And then, now, and then the port of Constanza becomes much more important. And then the Danube River, of course, which um, 
the headwaters are all the way back in Germany and it passes through about eight European countries to the Black Sea. Now the Danube becomes much more important and countries start investing in the maintenance of it. So you have more barge traffic, not just our grandparents on the river cruises. So uh, the, the river arteries are important for bulk cargo, fuel, for example, things that you don't wanna have on the highway or on rail if you don't have to. So this economic investment would not only change the economic dynamic of the Black Sea, but it also would lead to improved military mobility along the Danube River and other networks associated. Rail, uh, for example, no matter how big Constanza is, if you don't have rail and highways leading out of it, there, there's no point. And because of all of this, this is why the Russians have done everything they can to stop the Port of Anaclia project from ever happening for all those reasons. Uh, thank you. Tony, do you want to do you have anything to add as well? Uh, not not particularly. Um, good morning, Ian. Um, I think sort of as I um, indicated earlier, the, the problem with using civilian uh, assets for, uh, for military mobility is that these things are already very tight. They operate on a commercial basis and, and there isn't a great deal of availability of, of any of these things. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I think it's inevitable that uh, that military mobility will be hit by, uh, by um, COVID-19. On the positive side, uh, of course, is that as we rebuild civilian economies, which we'll need to do in, in the post-crisis time, um, that will also assist in, in rebuilding military mobility. And you know, here, things like the Three Seas Initiative will, will become important in, in finding the resources to, to rebuild, uh, rebuild our, our civilian infrastructure. Thank you, Tony. Uh, next. The next question is about uh, the recommendations. Uh, and it comes from the uh, ambassador of Japan to Estonia. Thank you very much. Uh, what can be done to, uh, to uh, make sure that the recommendations are, are spread as uh, effectively as possible, except for only distributing copies of this report or, or uh, through webinars? Uh, and, and the question is, is, are there any, any other opportunities or possibilities to, to make this message go through? Um, Tony, perhaps? Sure. I mean, uh, as a think tank, I mean, our, our job is to, to put out papers and, and distribute them as widely as possible so they get the, the best hearing possible. Uh, and that's that's the the core business and the core way that these things happen. But I think um, actually I'd like to, to ask Ben to say a couple of words about his military mobility workshops, which are an important uh, important aspect of this. Yeah, thanks, Tony and, and Ambassador. Thank you very much. Um, there's there's three or four efforts that are underway. Uh, the the kind of re excellent reporting that uh, Tony has done, as well as FOI, which is the Swedish Defense Research Agency. Uh, RAND Corporation and Atlantic Council also recently released, re released their report. Um, SEPA, the think tank for which I work, um, is hosting monthly uh, panels now on uh, military mobility. We just finished our second one. The next one will be on uh, 2 June. And each month we uh, look at different facets of the mobility challenge. And coming up uh, in, on 2 June, we're going to put a lot of uh, effort on cyber protection of transportation infrastructure. Uh, and I hope that, by the way, the uh, NATO Center of Excellence for Cyber Defense there in Tallinn uh, will participate as, as one of our panelists on that particular report, because um, the cyber protection is so important. And so the recommendations come out in these monthly panels. But the culminating event for us is going to be uh, a military mobility workshop which was supposed to be one and two April uh, in Brussels. Uh, we're gonna have it now probably in the middle of October in Brussels. Uh, it's gonna be wide open to the public uh, and at least in terms of information. We're gonna look at five scenarios. Uh, number one scenario was moving equipment from Norway to Estonia. So you have to move from uh, through Sweden across the Baltic into Estonia. The second scenario involves moving from Germany up through Poland and the Sawaki Corridor into Lithuania. The third scenario involves moving from uh, Western Europe down to the Fokshan Gate, which is the end of the Carpathians there uh, to the Black Sea. Uh, 
The fourth scenario involves moving from Western Europe into the Western Balkans. And then the fifth scenario uh, involves moving equipment and convoys from Europe uh, across the Mediterranean into Libya. And so we've got a, a working group of about 25 people for each of the five scenarios. And each working group is cross-functional. It has uh, people that work in all the different agencies of the European Union and the European Parliament, all the relevant headquarters of NATO, uh, SHAPE, the JSEC, uh, NFIU representatives, national headquarters, as well as uh, industry, the, the, the industry that's relevant, rail, bridging, cyber, air and missile defense, uh, for example. And then finally, we're going to have journalists that are embedded in each of the five working groups so that they can see and understand. And then, of course, part of the reason we're doing it in Brussels is to raise awareness, but also uh, turn up the heat, uh, raise a sense of urgency on these things that need to be done. So this is how we get out to people that care about mobility or should care about mobility is through the panels, uh, the workshops, and then finally, of course, exercises. Everybody in the world that heard about Defender 20 immediately equated that with, ah, oh, we're working on mobility. Uh, and, and that's an important part of it. Thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Stephen Danner. Uh, how do you see the US government and NATO countries funding modernization and readiness programs while COVID continues to take a lot of dollars? Are we at risk or of not modernizing and outfitting APS sites? Uh, General Hodges. Well, Steve, thanks for the question. Uh, of course, we're at risk. I mean, uh, you know, there was news out yesterday that it that from Secretary Esper, uh, the U.S. Secretary of Defense, about getting rid of legacy weapon systems, for example, so that we can modernize. Uh, so there's going to be there, there will be uh, trade offs, as there always are, and unfortunately, the typical uh, first target to come up with new uh, funding resources is the military. If there's if there's not a clear understanding of what the threat is, then uh, budget cutters, uh, experts start looking to uh, start looking to uh, cut the size of the of the military. So there is a risk there, uh, which is why it's going to take some political courage from our political elected officials to explain to their citizens what the threats are, and you know just take a look at history. Now, uh, there are some things I think that could be prioritized that are essential for military mobility and deterrence, but also have real value for the civilian side. And much of that is in the transportation networks uh, and infrastructure that we've talked about. Uh, bridging is an essential part of that. Everybody needs bridges, not just the military. So investment in bridging uh, not only would uh, enable uh, military mobility, essential to deterrence, but when you think of flooding uh, or uh, the quality of, of bridging that exists today, having military bridging to supplement that or to be used while uh, civilian bridging is, re is repaired, to me, this is a no-brainer. Um, and by the way, uh, a huge part of employment in most countries, certainly in Western Europe and the United States, is in the defense industry. So automatically cutting back on weapons production or military equipment production has an impact on uh, civilian employment as well. So I'm, I'm a little bit more optimistic. Uh, thank you, Tony. Do you have anything to add? I would, uh, I would only add that uh, it's important for those of us in the in the research community to to try and make sure that the lessons of of the last economic crisis, the two thousand eight crisis, uh, are are remembered and, and taken into account. I mean, I think it's probably inevitable that defence budgets are going to be cut in in coming years, but um, we can we can at least remind leaderships that uh, it was very painful to recover from the defence cuts that we made in two thousand eight, and perhaps just as importantly, uh, after two thousand eight. Defence cuts in Europe, at least, were made on a very uncoordinated basis. Nations weren't talking to each other about what they were going to be cutting, so we ended up with a very sort of unsuitable set of European force structures um, and was you know, still suffering the effects of that today. So uh, I would you know, advocate any of us who, who have the opportunity to, to sort of to make sure that those lessons are, uh, are remembered. Well, thank you.
then there is a question from uh, Nortautos Tatkus. Uh, it is about the uh, a sentence that was mentioned in the study, in the report. Uh, it says that planners assume that almost all of a large scale military movement from the Polish Lithuanian border forward uh, would need to be conducted by road. Uh, do you see the military significance of uh, the rail Baltic in the near future, this railway line uh, being planned to be constructed between the Baltic states and uh, Poland? And also a follow-on question, what could be done to speed up the construction of rail Baltic? Uh, and I would pass this question actually to, to both of you, starting with uh, General Hodges. So uh, there's two aspects of this. Uh, first, obviously rail Baltica is very important because that will facilitate rapid rail movement. And remember, we're trying to we're trying to move to prevent the conflict from ever, ha ever happening. Uh, the, the current requirement to transload uh, from a European gauge to uh, the Russian gauge <clears throat> rail, excuse me, <clears throat> is, is a problem. And, and so Rail Baltica, which is primarily an EU project, is something that uh, should, uh, should be continued to receive resources and should continue to receive um, pressure to get it done. Now, uh, it's a little frustrating to see that between Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, um, the, uh, for a variety of reasons, the Rail Baltica project is, for, is behind where it should be by now. And, and I think uh, this is a place where leaders have got to get together and uh, eliminate the mismanagement and the, and the frictions. And I know this is, if this was easy, it'd already be done. So I, I, I get that there are legitimate problems and challenges but this is important not only for the economies, but also for deterrence, which of course I remember the first time I heard about Real Baltica, it was in the context of Minister Lavrov saying that this was a provocative development. So of course the Russians don't wanna see something like Real, ba Real Baltica happen. The other part of this though, it highlights the importance of Belarus. Um, uh, is everything that we can do to normalize relationships uh, the relations with, with Minsk is to the benefit of the West so that uh, President Lukashenko is able to continue to resist pressure from the Kremlin to allow Russian troops to be, ground troops to be based in Belarus. Now, I'm not naive, but at the end of the day, it is much better that there are no Russian ground troops based in Belarus. And so this is, a, is an important aspect of, of deterrence as well involving diplomacy, some economic investment, give Belarus some options uh, other than having to be totally dependent on Russia without trying to get between them uh, and Russia. And of course, we have to keep an eye on this uh, nuclear power plant at Ostrovets, which our Lithuanian friends are rightfully concerned about. Thank you, General. Uh, Tony, anything to add on Ray Baltic? Um, as, a, as a general point, I'd just point out that the report um, emphasises the importance of the railways for, for movement. I mean, the road network is important, of course, uh, but in terms of speed, in terms of volume of movement, in terms of control, the railways are a much better option. And, and we have very much stressed that, that this is where the sort of emphasis should lie. Um, ben just mentioned the, the, the gauge change. For those who aren't aware, when you, um, when you travel from, from mainland Europe up to the Baltic region, uh, you, you change from the European rail gauge to the Russian rail gauge. And that means that when you cross the Polish-Lithuanian border, you have to physically unload your armored vehicles from one train and reload them onto a second train. Um, the Lithuanians have done a fantastic job in investing in the, um, in the equipment that you would need to, to do that. And they can do it much more quickly than, than, than would have been the case several years ago. But still, this is obviously a bottleneck in terms of moving, uh, moving large volumes of military equipment. Um, so in that sense, Rail Baltica is, uh, is very important because it will bring the European gauge all the way up to, uh, to, to Tallinn. At the moment, it only goes as far as, as Kaunas in, uh, in Lithuania. Uh, in, in terms of the question about um, how we can speed up Rail Baltica, I, mean, I think that's sort of beyond the scope of, of, of our studies, but uh, you know, I don't think there's a silver bullet solution here. Basically, this is a trust problem. I mean, we see in military uh, cooperation, defence cooperation, that a lack of trust between nations makes cooperation very difficult. I think we see the same thing in, in Rail Baltica. And uh, I don't think there's, a, there's an obvious answer to that other than to, to sort of keep plugging away and working on it. Up. 
Well, thank you. Thank you, both of you. Uh, I think it's, what is important in Estonia is, of course, to emphasize that this is not only an economic project. It's, uh, it has a strategic uh, aspect and dimension as well. Uh, another question from James Scher. Uh, it is about uh, this uh, Chinese Belt and Road Initiative. And if you look at the report, it, uh, I think it doesn't really mention China. Uh, and what is and what will be the impact of the Belt and Road Initiative on, on NATO reinforcement or reinforcement from North, North America to Europe and within Europe? Uh, and I would ask for uh, the views of both gentlemen, uh, perhaps this time starting with Tony. Oh, I'm sorry, Martin, I'm going to have to ask you to repeat the question. I, uh, I missed that. Yeah, it's the impact of the uh, Chinese Belt and Road Initiative on on uh, reinforcements in Europe. Uh, yeah, it's it's not something that we particularly looked at. Um, again, it's probably worth mentioning the Three Seas Initiative, which is at least in part a response to the Belt and Road Initiative to try and make sure that um, infrastructure is 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 in um, Western hands and. Uh, under Western control, but it, it's as I say, it's not something that we, we really looked at in our report, and, and I wouldn't uh, wouldn't wish to comment on. So uh, I'm very concerned about the Chinese control of infrastructure. Uh, it's um, they're, they're not just building; they they control. When you think about the Port of Piraeus uh, near Athens, uh, but also at the other end of the Netherlands, they they control significant amounts of ports uh, and. Um, the, the, the risk for us is if we got into a conflict with, with uh, Russia somehow, and then you have a, a frankly, a, a not very friendly uh, potential adversary like uh, the Chinese Communist Party controlling infrastructure that we depend on, this, this is a real vulnerability. Uh, and uh, the Chinese are, of course, uh, have bought huge influence uh, with uh, inside Hungary inside Greece, inside the Czech Republic, uh, and in Italy through infrastructure investment. And, and so you can see the, the potential threat uh, of governments being pulled in different directions because the infrastructure and the amount of money that's involved uh, goes to China. Already, um, some of these countries I just named have, have diluted or watered down efforts by the European Union to hold the Chinese accountable, for example, for human rights violations against the Uyghurs. Uh, th this, this, is, this is not inconsequential. Now, what I would prefer is to see us, the West, compete. If we don't, if we don't invest in things like the Three Seas Initiative that Tony alluded to, if we don't invest in these projects to improve infrastructure that everybody knows always helps economic development when you have better infrastructure, uh, then countries, smaller countries are going to turn to the Chinese who have so much, who are willing to invest so much in terms of resources. And that creates a, uh, a vulnerability. Now, I'm not against trade with China. All of us, certainly the United States, um, has huge um, uh, trade already, and we would like to continue that. But the, the lack of transparency by the Chinese Communist Party on how they do things, the, the industrial level theft of technology uh, makes, uh, should cause us all to be very wary of what we do with them. And again, this is why the United States really needs to work closely with our allies um, and, and work to work through international organizations instead of leaving international organizations and work through international organizations to keep pressure on China to be transparent and to live up to uh, its, uh, what it, its obligations. Thank you. Uh, then the next question is about uh, military movement across Europe and, uh, and uh, competition. It comes from Laur Kivilo. Uh, uh, military movement across Europe relies heavily on civilian assets and different nations are most likely going to fight for the same assets when the decision to move is made. What would have, uh, that would have a crucial effect on all movement plans and would definitely increase the price of civilian transport. So do you have any ideas or recommendations how this could be avoided or mitigated? And uh, I would ask both speakers to, uh, 
to uh, comment on this. Uh, General Hodges, perhaps first. Well, as, as Tony said very clearly earlier, there is inadequate capacity already. I mean, there's not extra stuff sitting around. Um, and nations are gonna be reluctant to have excess capacity just in case when, when already uh, things are tight. So um, finding ways to incentivize having excess capacity uh, and to uh, incentivize innovation uh, would be very important. This also goes to societal resilience and recognition, understanding of, of what's going on. I, uh, I was stationed in Korea for a year when I was a major back in the 1990s. And every year they would do national exercises where transportation infrastructure and networks were 100% diverted to the military, the, the ROC Army, uh, to practice in case of an emergency. And this, people didn't love it, but the population understood that this was necessary because of the threat that they perceived coming from North Korea. So practicing and, and having an understanding uh, of these kind of things is important. And of course, this takes courage from elected officials to be willing to address this to their uh, populations. Now, the, the military mobility challenge that we talked about at the beginning is also, um, for, for me, it's about being able to do this in peacetime conditions when competition for these resources will be at the highest. So the military, prior to declaration of a, of a crisis, will not automatically get priority for rail. So we'll be competing with everybody else, all the businesses that are using rail or that are uh, on the bridges. When you think about the number of, of bridges that can sustain the weight of modern equipment over the various uh, rivers between Germany and Thailand, there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of bridging. And uh, if, there, if we're approaching a crisis, you can anticipate a lot of civilian traffic perhaps heading away from the potential crisis. Uh, we can't assume that those bridges will all be still standing or operational. Another reason you need to have some excess capacity in bridging. So Laurie's question is, is a very good one. Um, the government, our governments are gonna to have to be clear uh, about uh, what those priorities are. And it's gonna to have to happen in a very, very short time under, under a lot of stress. So the more that our civilian leaders can participate in crisis decision exercises, uh, the better. Thank you. Tony, anything to add? Uh, so Ben just pointed out uh, that, that the military won't have priority over the civilians necessarily in, in a movement, which is true, but also uh, within the military movement, there's not much by way of prioritization going on. So I see this as being part of the command control coordination piece. There's no agency that decides which uh, particular unit moves first to meet the Joint Force Commander's needs. If you're a national uh, movements coordination center, say in Poland, you'll move on a first come first serve basis. Whoever gets to your border first will be the first to leave the border the other side. Um, so I think you know, in, in term, in part, of, you know, as part of sorting out this whole business of command and control responsibilities, um, procedures, and so on, we, we need to think about who and how uh, prioritization of the, the the overall military transport takes place. Good. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, if there are no further questions from the audience, I would uh, like to ask both our speakers whether they have something to add or, or any final remarks. General Hodges, first, perhaps. Well, only to add uh, how, how uh, pleased I was to have the chance to work with uh, ICDS uh, on this report, but also in general, and this is a this is a great uh, organization that really uh, you guys do hard work, uh, crisp analysis, and uh, so I'm obviously I'm proud to be uh, associated with it. And uh, and y'all help run one of the best conferences in in, uh, in Europe each year, the Leonard Mary Conference as well. Uh, and Estonia sets a great example for everybody. Um, you guys live up to Article Three of the Washington Treaty, which says that every nation is supposed to be prepared to defend itself, to do everything necessary to defend itself, as well as help others. Uh, and you do that in, in, all, in all facets. Uh, your center of excellence for cyber defense is probably one of the top two or three of all the community of centers of excellence across NATO. And 
So just my, my thanks to our uh, Estonian allies uh, for uh, what you do to help um, uh, our great alliance. Thank you, Tony. Uh, well, I must also, of course, uh, say how uh, how good it was to work with Zebra on this particular project. Uh, I think we we made a good uh, a good team together. But my uh, final remark would be to to be ref to reflect the um, uh, Japanese ambassador's uh, earlier question. Say, uh, go to our website and, and and read the report, and you might also find some other stuff that's of interest to you there as well. Uh, thank you. Uh, probably one of the conclusions uh, one could make of this uh, webinar is, of course, the importance of exercises and uh, to do it uh, regularly, to stress test, uh, to rehearse reinforcement. Uh, with this, I would like to thank both our speakers for uh, talking to us today and also SIPA, with whom this report was written and published. I also want to thank our audience for taking the time webinar and for all the excellent questions. Uh, stay safe, stay healthy, and if we are lucky, then we will hopefully meet again in a live seminar or conference, uh, uh, hopefully soon. Thank you.